Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra and these are the key global headlines we are tracking this evening. European Parliament declares Russia to be a state sponsor of terror, says Russia's deliberate attacks on Ukraine is a violation of human rights and international laws. Ukraine President Zelensky urges the United Nations to step in as Russia continues to strike Kyiv's critical infrastructure. Pakistan Prime Minister appoints Lieutenant General Asim Munir as the new army chief. Munir will take over from outgoing General Javed Bajwa, who retires next week. Foxconn apologizes for a technical error during onboarding process after massive protests at its COVID-hit iPhone factory over a pay dispute. The company says actual pay would be the same as agreed. The European Union proposes a price cap on gas prices to stave off an impending energy crisis. Nations like Netherlands and Germany are skeptical about the move. The EU maintains that the proposal is balanced and will help the bloc avoid excessively high prices. Another shooting in the United States. A man suspected to be a Walmart employee opens fire in a Virginia store, kills six before shooting himself. The European Parliament has declared Russia as a state sponsor of terror, stating that Russia has violated human rights and the international humanitarian law. President Zelensky welcomed the move and urged the United Nations Security Council to act against Russia. In a video message, the president said, and I quote, Today is just one day, but we have received 70 missiles. That's a Russian formula of terror. End of quote. Russia has been firing missiles at Ukraine's critical infrastructure, like nuclear power plants. The attack on Ukraine's prime power grid left citizens without electricity or water, with Kyiv's mayor saying that nearly 70% of the city is still without any electricity. This has caused a ripple effect across the border, with Moldova losing power across half the country. Anna Chernikova, a reporter from The Voice of America, is joining us live from Kyiv right now. Anna, give us a sense uh, of where you are right now. We have been reading reports of massive power cuts across Ukraine because of the Russian airstrikes that have been happening. What is the current situation? Uh, hello. Well, uh, I'm standing right next to one of the energy facilities that was almost hit by Russian missile for a couple of times already. Uh, I cannot, unfortunately, tell the direct loca the exact location uh, but, but due to security reasons. But what I can say is that yesterday it was another massive attack uh, on the Ukraine, particularly on the Ukrainian energy infrastructure. And today, uh, the city of Kyiv and also other cities across Ukraine are still suffering from lack of energy, electricity and water supply. Uh, it's still a big problem. So uh, now uh, it's still uh, no electricity uh, in many cities in Ukraine for the whole day um, today. Uh, and water supply is also a big problem. However, uh, most of the cities are, have, have water supply back. So what I can say is that situation is really difficult. People are, are really coping as much as they can. Uh, they uh, buy generators, they buy alternative sources of energy to be able to stay uh, at least charged uh, and to be able to, uh, uh, to actually stay in touch with their relatives. Uh, so uh, what I can say is that uh, right. the area Anna. where I'm standing right now it still has no electricity. So, uh, well, as I already said, for today, almost the whole day, uh, it's no electricity supply at all. Right. You're saying that uh, no electricity supply almost for an entire day. So how has the life of an ordinary Ukrainian been impacted? So you're saying the place where you are, you've seen almost a 24-hour power cut. Is this the situation across different parts of Ukraine? Have, have, mess, have yes, some parts been without electricity for, uh, for two to three days? What about the water situation? What about uh, the road and infrastructure situation? Uh, well, uh, not two to three days, uh, not yet at least. Uh, so uh, what I can say is that now it's, uh, it's around 12 hours in some places more, in some places less, but there is no electricity for around uh, half a day now uh, in total if we, if we count in hours. And unfortunately, similar situation is in very different parts of Ukraine, uh, central part, north, west, south, and east. Uh, people are coping. Well, it's difficult. Of course, it's difficult for people. People are trying to cope as much as they can. 
some people buy alternative sources of energy, like generators, for instance, to be able to at least charge their phones and to cook some easy stuff uh, and to boil water. Uh, so, um, and also a lot of businesses, a lot of offices uh, are also providing, uh, genera uh, with generators, providing people spaces to charge and to heat. Uh, One quick the question, farm, uh, does the current the situation that... impact the Ukraine military's ability to hit back at Russia? Uh, no, uh, Ukrainian military continue their, uh, their uh, operations and continue their actions. Uh, it doesn't really, uh, so they have their own uh, separate uh, sources of energy on the front, at the front line. And also for people, President Zelensky confirmed that it is all, uh, already around 4,000 uh, places, special points, where people can come to heat and to charge. Uh, these places are around the town, and they have water supply and, heat, uh, and electricity supply. So uh, in case there is critical situation for a couple of days, people have certain place to go. Right. Okay, Anna Chernikova, thank you very much for uh, stepping out, giving us a sense of what's happening in uh, Ukraine right now. Stay safe, and thanks once again for joining us with that comprehensive ground report. Let's take this forward with Alexander Kara, diplomat and fellow at the Center of Defense Strategies. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Uh, Alexander, let me begin by asking you, uh, we are looking at power cuts, and possibly I get a sense that where you are right now, you're also witnessing a power cut situation. Uh, does this somehow complicate things for uh, Ukraine and the current round of missile strikes on Ukraine's power infrastructure, energy infrastructure, what do you think is triggering this response from the Russians? Uh, thank you for having me. And certainly it was not just symbolic that the European Parliament recognized Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism, because terrorism is a mean how Russia fights in for wars, not just in Ukraine. We've seen it in Syria, we've seen reports in Mali, in some other African countries. The Russians are savages who disregard international law. And having no ability to beat Ukrainian armed forces on the battleground, they turn to uh, the destruction of the civilian infrastructure, trying to break our will, trying to cause a huge outflow of Ukrainian refugees to uh, Europe, undermine and in European support of Ukraine. But certainly it's, it's failing. Yes, up to 40% of our energy, uh, energy facilities has been struck, and our heroes, I would say, uh, the, the engineers, are trying to restore it. I've been without electricity just for five hours. I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to live in the capital. And I know my parents, just in outskirts, uh, have been without electricity for, for 48 hours already. And there are some uh, other places in, in Ukraine with more, let's say, a dire straits uh, than, than, than we have. But anyway, it's not going to affect our will to fight back, and uh, we are fighting the right cause, uh, the war for independence of the neo-colonial power who wants to impose its will on us. So we have no choice but to fight back. Uh, Alexander, we're also reading that the last three nuclear power stations in Ukraine have been disconnected from the power grid. How could this complicate the energy situation for Ukraine going into winter? Uh, first of all, we should say that Russia is a major nuclear power who is waging war against non-nuclear uh, um, power, in the Ukraine. And then Russia ceased. It's just the first uh, in, in the world case when the, the country or the state is capturing the nuclear power station. In the beginning, it was Chernobyl power station, different Ukrainian nuclear power uh, plants that, you know, famous, uh, infamous in the world uh, because of the disaster. And now uh, Russians are taking hostage of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the biggest in, in Europe. Uh, with these missile attacks, they cut off uh, the supplies of uh, energy from uh, the rest of Ukrainian nuclear power plants, and they, they just pushed a bit of our infrastructure to the catastrophe. Because, you know, if there is no uh, power supply to the energy units, there would be uh, a possibility of the nuclear disaster. Yes, it, it's, it's really considerable, and the Russian relay on this harm uh, to push Ukrainian government to accept uh, unacceptable terms of the negotiations with Russia, which is actually laying down uh, our arms and agreeing of being subjected to Russia. Alexander, do you feel that uh, 
Ukrainians, it was already speculated that Europe will have a harsh winter. But looking at the kind of power cuts, looking at the water situation, uh, do you think Ukrainians are heading for a very, very difficult time that will test their resolve in this, uh, in this war against Russia? Well, certainly we are into dif difficult times uh, this winter, but uh, I don't think that it will change the minds of Ukrainians and they would press our President Zelensky or our government uh, to agree on the Russian terms because it's just, no, it's a genocidal war and the world witnessed uh, Borodyanka and, and some other places and recently liberated from Russia. They've been killing innocent people. They are killing uh, just children. Actually, you know, it's really symbolic uh, with this missile attack. Uh, they, they, they targeted the uh, hospital, the, the women's hospital in, in, near Kiev, and they killed nine, uh, well, actually, just newly born baby. Uh, this baby was born after the nine uh, months of the Russian aggression. So uh, certainly it's going to test our resolve, but uh, for sure Ukrainians are gathering to, to fight back. And, you know, one of the first reactions on any missile attacks Ukrainians are donating money for weapons for arm our forces uh, to beat the Russians and to get them out of power land. All right. Uh, Alexander Kara, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for joining us. Uh, despite being in a difficult situation, uh, there are power cuts at the place where you are. Ukrainians are facing water shortages, food shortages. But despite that, the resolve of an ordinary Ukrainian has not been broken. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for joining us. Shifting focus now to the measles outbreak that the World Health Organization is worried about. The outbreak has now spread to at least 26 nations as well as large parts of India. The central government has rushed special teams for three states. The other major concern, record high COVID cases in China since the start of the pandemic. I caught up with Dr. Margaret Harris, WHO spokesperson, and I began by asking her about the outbreak of measles and the seriousness of it all. Our progress towards eliminating measles has really now threatened by major setbacks that started in 2020 uh, during the COVID-19 vaccine pandemic. We're now seeing record lows of of Im under immunized or not immunized children, nearly 40 million children now are really, really susceptible to uh, measles outbreaks. So we're we're in a situation where it's an imminent catastrophe, but one that we can turn around if we take action now. Uh, and is this primarily because over the two years of the pandemic, uh, the immunization for measles took a back seat? Everything really, unfortunately, took a back seat. We've seen that routine immunization of children was severely affected because the world was focusing on COVID. Interestingly, we didn't see large outbreaks of measles when so much of the world was in lockdown. But now we are seeing outbreaks. And now we've got, as I said, huge numbers of very young children who are susceptible. And this is a deadly disease. This is a big killer of young children. Uh, which are the countries which could be the worst affected? And where you're seeing a big rise in measles cases? We've seen at least 26 countries reporting outbreaks. And uh, now one of the biggest problems is surveillance. So while I'm talking about outbreaks, we know that there are many more cases that are actually being reported because, again, countries were so focused on COVID that the testing, the, the, uh, the tracking of measles that was going on before hasn't been happening. And now it's critical that countries really step that up to protect our most precious asset, our small children. Hmm. Right. Uh what about India? Any outlook on India? What is the situation with measles as far as India goes? It's an issue for India as well, definitely. Of the, the 10 countries with the largest number of immunized, unimmunized children, uh, India is one of them. Now, of course, India has a huge population, so that's why you have those large numbers. But India also is very good at immunization and very good at public health. So it, it means that they, India can turn this around and needs to focus, really be committed to getting that, that surveillance underway again, getting the immunization happening, really building up the local basic healthcare services and encouraging parents to bring their babies to be vaccinated at the right time. 
any immediate measures that you're recommending to countries, uh, especially India? To all countries. This, this applies to all countries. There is not one WHO region that is doing well at the moment. So uh, it, this is something that we as the world really face. Measles is a highly contagious um, virus. In fact, before we saw COVID, the Delta and um, Omicron versions of, of COVID, it was the most infectious virus on the planet. Uh, and one infected person can uh, can infect another 20 people around, 18 to 20 people around them. So it spreads like wildfire. So every country, every health service in the world needs to really now step up efforts to track measles and to get all the, the children immunized. Right. My final question, Dr. Harris, and this is on COVID. The news coming in from China that with over 30,000 cases, China is seeing a record high in daily cases since the start of the pandemic. How serious is this for the world right now? Well, this is a warning. COVID certainly hasn't gone. Now, a lot of countries have really stepped up their vaccination, and that is protecting a lot of people. We're seeing fewer people die, but we still are seeing 7,000 to 8,000 people dying every week. And so COVID is not last year's news. It's still very much with us. And we have to take COVID as seriously as the other threats. Yes, uh, 40 million children facing the risk of uh, measles and the examples coming from China of record high COVID cases only telling us and warning us that COVID is not over. We need to keep up the immunization program. We're heading into a short break, but coming up on the other side, India and UK are gearing up for the next round of negotiations on the trade deal. But is it really so simple? What are the hurdles? We have a special discussion with Prabhash Ranjan of Jindal Global Law School when we're back. <laughs>